and um, so meeting is a, is, is a is a term that I borrowed from uh, Martin Buber from I and Thou. And in his concept, that is where I encounter someone with my whole being, where I meet them I to you. So that person is no longer just an object in my mind or a uh, something to be used or organized or thought about, but they are a reciprocal partner in the moment. So when we are meeting another, we are encountering them as a partner in, 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 in the cosmic dance. When that happens, there are no objects. There is just now. And we shift into a different state of being whenever we meet. We shift into a different state of awareness, one where it's not object-based. So in, in finding you in a world of it, I postulated one model, which is just an idea, which is that how about if we think about these things as two different types of operating systems, like computers, like you have, you have the Macintosh Apple operating system and you have the PC uh, operating system and um, Windows, I guess. And, and the two of them don't talk to each other very well. They're very different. They process information very differently. So you can't just pick up one computer and, and run the same processes from both systems on it, although now there are ways that they can kind of they can kind of mesh, but the uh, they're very distinct ways of processing information. So as a model, I suggested that hey, what about we think about the way we are aware in the world as two different things: one, an objective way of thinking, which is where we think representationally, that is, we come up with an idea about something, we slap a name on it, we have an experience, and then we can then say, oh, that is like this other thing. So there's a thunderstorm. So, oh, okay, that's really cool. And there, are, these are the qualities of a thunderstorm. This is what makes a thunderstorm unique. And this is I can then put it in the catalog with all the other thunderstorms that I've experienced and I can tell a story about, oh, was it at a really intense thunderstorm the other night? And uh, that kind of thing. And so you can tell a story about it, which is really handy whenever you want to talk to other humans and you want to uh, write things and, and, and make systems of thought and say, okay, this is a fact because a lot of us agree that this is a fact. So therefore this particular story is really solid and we're gonna go with that. And those are object-based, that's an object-based system there. So these are mind objects. So then I postulated that there's this whole other way of being aware, which is non-objective a non-objective awareness. We got object-based consciousness and non-objective awareness. And in that, there, you, there is just presence. That is where you are present without objects, where you're not thinking about anything, where you enter the gap between thoughts and you, uh, you get the gap between thoughts and you are then aware, present, but you're not thinking about anything. And you can quickly shift between the two. So in meeting, we're shifting between the two. We are aware of our circumstances, which is an object-based thought. And we have, we're also able to go into the gap between thoughts and go into that objectless awareness, which we do whenever we encounter, engage another with our whole being. 
So the question that came up was, how do we practice on our own? So it's one thing, most of us have had experiences where like you're so in such rapport with another person that, oh man, this, you know, time just dissolves and, and like, oh my God, I can't believe it's three in the morning because we've been doing this for hours and it just, time just went by like that. And that's what happens in that object less awareness, the non-objective awareness. And those things usually happen by serendipity. We just, it just sort of happens to us. And so as a result, we tend to think that we can't control it or we can't set the, up the circumstances for it. But I'd like to think that we can. I'd like to think that we are capable of creating meeting, at least generated by yourself, even if the other person does not meet you back. And in which case you can also meet non-humans. You know, Martin Buber talks about this. He talks about meeting plants and animals at the pre-verbal level. And then humans meeting other humans. And then he says, then also, then you can meet the spirit world or the, you know, those beings or being that is beyond human, that beyond form. And then you get to, there's a whole different quality there. So the question came up is, how do we practice meeting with ourselves? How do we, how do we engage that? And that is, I think, a really important skill to develop. It's not something, I think that your capacity to meet others will only be enhanced by your ability to meet whenever you're not being met back. You don't need that encouragement because what happens just by doing that, just by meeting, you are then able to shift between those two different states of awareness, the object-based consciousness, non-objective awareness, and you're able to, to practice moving between those two different operating systems so that you get really comfortable with it. So it's, oh, this is cool. And you also get comfortable moving to the gap between thoughts, which is the, you know, what a lot of meditation is, is about. It's about getting us to that place. And in fact, you could say that meditation is primarily about practice at getting to the gap between thoughts, where you're able to suspend your thinking mind for a moment your rational, analytical mind, yet still be present and aware. So the, um, the steps to meeting that I postulate in the book are, first thing, you want to get coherent. That means move into a state of wholeness. So to meet someone with your whole being, you got to be whole. And it's, it's one of those elusive things for a lot of people. But if you are able to access your energetic coherence on a, on a regular basis, you get really comfortable moving into that state of wholeness. Why? Because you're bringing your awareness to the feeling mode in addition to the the thinking mode and so then you're able to shift into a super conscious state so if you just practice it with me right now if you just want to feel your index finger just put them in your lap you want to point and reach with your index fingers and Feel into that. When I say feel into that, I mean actually feel your finger. And sometimes it helps just to wiggle your finger a little bit. And so you are actually activating 
a whole different part of your nervous system. You're accessing the sensory neural network. And it's, it's usually happening at a pre-conscious level, that is below the level of, of, of thought, below the level of thinking, that these things that we usually just get a synopsis from the nervous system arrives at the conscious mind and saying, oh, hot or wet. And that is the type of feeling it comes to as a, at a verbal level. What I'm asking you to do is to actually feel and not think about it, just feel it. And it's a different way of being. And whenever you do that, you immediately shift into a, the gap between thoughts and you move into a um, super conscious state where your body, mind, and spirit are integrated very easily, relaxedly. And you learn to get comfortable with that so that you're able to actually occupy that space for an extended period of time. And even more important, be able to shift in and out of that state so that you can move to energetic coherence slash wholeness anytime you want. This is not yet meeting. This is step number one. It gets you back to wholeness. So you are in this clear-minded state, very present, and feeling unified and integrated. The second step goes, takes presence to an even greater degree. And that is where you actually consciously decide to occupy the present moment. So anytime you're thinking about stuff, you're not really there. You're thinking about there. So you, if you're thinking about the present moment, you're, it takes a quarter to half a second to process that through your nervous system. So you're slightly out of the present moment. You're looking at what the present moment looked like to have a second ago and runs through a different part of your brain. And we don't usually notice it because it's, you know, everybody else is doing it that way. So it's, uh, you don't really notice it, but you do notice it whenever you're playing some sort of sport, say where timing is important, where like a half a second to respond to a punch being thrown at you is a long time. If someone's throwing a fastball and you're playing baseball, 95 mile an hour fast, fastball, half a second is an eternity. And that's true of everything. Also, if you go into your head and you think about the moment when you're in your golf swing, I don't care whatever it is, you're thinking about it, you are out of sync with the present moment. You are creating a dissonance. Yeah, and so your performance drops precipitously. So we want to get present. And a presence is making a decision to be in the now. Not in my thoughts, but now. And if I'm thinking, if I'm talking, you know, there's a part of me which is doing something else. So right now, as I'm talking with you, I'm having to toggle back and forth between the present moment and talking. And so, and that's something that you practice so that you get really good at it so that you hardly notice. But so one way of, of uh, establishing presence, that I, a fun way that I, I've used in the past is to just ask the question, where am I now? And answer, here I am. And that here I am acts as a, a locator. As you're not locating, oh, I'm in the room, I'm talking to these people, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm in New York City. It's that no, those are all objects. Those are all mind objects. They're part of the story. We're moving outside of the story and we're saying, where am I? Here. 
when, now. And so it becomes, you're establishing presence as a, a thing which is not determined by objects. It is just here and it's now. So it's an absolute location in the present. So we have wholeness, we have presence, and then once we establish that, then we reach out. We find someone, we notice, oh, there's someone there I would like to meet, someone or something I would like to meet. And then you extend your awareness out and you locate that person that you would like to meet or that thing. So as we were talked about, it's like, you know, you can do it with the animals, the plants, you know, who hasn't had a cat, you know, and you look in the cat's eyes and, you know, the cat is just like there and you're there. It's like, okay, this is really cool. That's, that's, that's meeting, you know, or a dog or whatever, but you can do it with a tree. You can do it with a mountain. You can do it. And what it does is it changes you whenever you extend in that way. This is really woo woo stuff we're talking about here, but for me, it is, this is the foundation. This makes it all work. So if I meet, let's say my hand, right? There's, I can look at my hand, hello hand, and I can, uh, I can notice it. I can notice it's the different qualities of it there and the fingers and all its flaws and its beauty and uh, its potential and its ability and its, and, and everything else about it, or uh, so I can do that. And that's an object based thing. I'm an observer of the hand. And to be an observer of the hand, I have to be separate from the hand. Even though it's my hand, I think that, okay, there's me and there's my, my hand. And we're two poles in this terminal, which is cool, because then I get to know something about the hand. And I'd be able to talk about the hand and say, hey, this is a cool hand, you know. Um, but if I want to meet the hand, then I say, where are you now? Here you are. And in that moment of recognition of my hand, as my partner in this investigation, magic happens. You know, Buber says that God is the electricity that flows between two people when they meet like that. And I, I concur. To me, that is spirit. That is where we, we ride the lightning of spirit is when we do that. But we don't have to be met back in order to make that happen. And we benefit just by the fact of meeting whether or not we are met back or not. And the beautiful thing is it will change the world around you if you do that. People will respond to you differently when they see you're doing it because when you do that, you are awake. You are engaged in the world in a way that is no longer somnambulism you're no longer sleepwalking through life, and they're just playing out old reels of movies that of your life in your head, and you're, you know, ruminating about past wrongs that people have done to you, or about the, you know, your hopes and dreams, or whatever. These are all thoughts. These are all object thought mind objects which are beautiful and, and we all need those and want those, but when you're in a meeting state, so practicing that, we got three steps. Get coherent. So point, reach, feel yourself into a state of wholeness. Two, get present. Even more present. Where am I now? Here I am. And it's not, you're not looking for information when you say, where am I now? You are, it is a call and response to the universe. It is a call and response to yourself. You are 
zeroing in. Ah, here I am. And then, you know, you light up. Then you extend from wholeness and presence, you extend to other, be it animal, vegetable, mineral, human, spirit, whatever you say, you. And when, when you say you, you shift into that whole way of, different way of being. Meeting includes both the objective and the non-objective. So meeting also includes awareness of context. I mean, you say, okay, what game am I playing now? And being aware of that, the context in which you are meeting. And that's where the fun begins. Because now you've got, you're playing a game, you've got a partner in the game. Even if the partner is a rock or a caterpillar, it's your partner. Hey, buddy, let's play. And then fun stuff happens. It brings you into the present and you get enlivened in life. 